Great to be with you today. We're going to continue from Luke chapter 15, a famous chapter. And uh, we're going to get to the part of the chapter that I submit is least known. And yet, uh, wouldn't you believe it, that maybe it's the one we need to focus on the most. So we'll, we'll have a great time today. So sit back, just discard whatever else is going, and let's be together for this half hour. Uh, the prayer center is open. Our prayer partners are standing by, prayer ministers ready to pray with you. And you can also text me. You see that information throughout the program. Uh, but before we get into it, uh, watch this. Get ready for a global spiritual awakening. Join 3,500 students who have already been trained at World Impact Bible Institute. With seven campuses across Asia and Africa, World Impact Bible Institute is now launching in Toronto, Canada in September 2022. Academic excellence, fresh insights, spiritual growth. You can expect all that and much more. You can truly discover the power of Christ and live it out and walk in your destiny with what you gain in Weeby. I'm so thankful and so indebted to World Impact Bible Institute for how they have helped me come alive in my walk with Christ. Students, teachers, business people, retirees, even established pastors and bishops have received spirit-empowered equipping. Learn from an international faculty with a high academic standard and hands-on experience. I believe that God has been and is now calling people from all walks of life to proclaim the gospel to the nations with clarity and power. And our desire at Weeby is to equip students with a solid grasp of biblical knowledge and all the practical ministry skills they need to fulfill their calling and step into their God-given destiny. Call now, 416-745-1820 to receive your information package or go online at Weeby.com. I learned about the gospel, like what it really means, you know, that Jesus came um, as our answer. And I learned about also the importance of sharing the gospel, you know, really that it is the power of God. After you go through Weeby, after you learn all of these things, just prepare yourself for a great ministry because God has a plan for every single one of us. To attend World Impact Bible Institute is to step in to a world of faith because surely there will be challenges, maybe financial, maybe a rearrangement of priorities, maybe even changing your geographical location. But in all of that, you will discover that Christ in you is greater than the challenges. And most of all, you will position yourself to be a part of a worldwide spiritual awakening. Weeby, the place for you to discover your destiny and step into your calling. So help us spread the word. People from coast to coast, United States and Canada are contacting us by the hundreds, wanting to know the information. It's going to be a great school year. Some, of course, are from outside Canada and United States, but most are from these countries. And so uh, don't miss this. Uh, don't miss your place of destiny. We're coming to the end of Luke chapter 15. And uh, I want to set the stage again so we see the context uh, it, verses 1 and 2 explains why the chapter exists. It is because of a speech that Jesus gave as a rebuttal to a, an attack. Uh, the, the, the religious leaders were indignant, angry, outraged at Jesus. So we read in the Amplified verse 1, Now the tax collectors and notorious and especially wicked sinners were all coming near to Jesus to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes, the, these is the religious elite that I kind of call them in an all-inclusive inclusive term, they kept on muttering, speaking under their breath, so to speak, and indignantly complaining, saying, this man, this, this man Jesus, he accepts and receives and welcomes preeminently wicked sinners, and he eats with them. You know, in the Middle Eastern culture, eating is a celebration. He's, this is the gospel. God welcomes, God receives, God fellowships with people that are sinners, that are burdened with shame and guilt. And then, then, then Jesus told the story, four stories actually, about the sh sheep that was lost, though he didn't know it was lost, and the shepherd who went looking for it until he found it. 
the love that won't let go. And then the woman who lost one of her beautiful coins out of her necklace, and she went searching for it until she found it, the love that won't let go. And then he told about a father with two sons and the younger son who was far off in a, in a far off country de demonstrating his independence from his father. And yet the father wouldn't let go, kept looking for him, received him with hugs and kisses. But then there was the older brother. Now his older brother was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house, Notice he was in the field. He was out there working, possibly working to gain the favor of his father. He heard music and dancing. So he didn't go to his dad. Strange, isn't it? He called one of the servants. Maybe he felt more comfortable with the employees than with his father. And he asked the servants what these things meant. I think, sadly, here is a picture. The older brother depicts religion without relationship. He's out there working in the field, and, 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 and maybe he was constantly struggling to gain the acceptance of his father. So he thought, although he already had the acceptance of his father, that's how many Christians feel. They feel like, I just want to work for God so that God can be pleased with me, so that God can think I'm, I'm good enough to receive his blessing. He's out there working. And then he heard that his brother had come back. And so again, I asked, why didn't he go to the father? Why didn't he ask the father? It's possibly he didn't have a relationship or a bad relationship. It was like an outsider. You know, many people, even though they go to church Sunday after Sunday, see themselves as outsiders. They see God as out there and God would come and touch me, and God, God, he's, I'm calling on God. They don't see themselves united in a relationship with God. And the father said, or the servant said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed a fatted calf. In other words, he's saying there's a big party. There's a big celebration on. But the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. What a picture. You know, some people, they want to go to heaven. They just don't want anybody else, especially certain people, not to be there. You know, in the Middle Eastern culture, again, the fact that the older brother didn't want to go in and join the banquet, it was an insult. In a way, the story of the older brother, though not as famous as the younger brother who, who defied his father and went into a far-off country, the older brother is doing on the home turf what the younger brother did by going into a far country. And he's saying, I don't want to join. I don't want to be with my father. My father has a banquet. There's too much joy. There's too much music and dancing. You know, some people, they just want religion to be drab, dull, and boring. And then it happened, just as it did for the younger brother, where the father was looking, he says, Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. This was breaking all the rules and the traditions. The father shouldn't go out and plead with the son. The son should obey his father. That's Middle Eastern culture. The, the, the son should have just not defied his father, but, but he's there in defiance. He says, I'm not going to go in. I'm not going to. I'm just gonna, not going to receive this, this joyous. Religion should be somber. It should be serious. And that we can agree on, but not somber. He said, the music and dancing, I, I, I know. But the father says, I'm going to go and plead with you. He gives him the same treatment as the younger brother had received. It tells us that God loved the religious Pharisee. God loved the religious older brother. And you know, some people, people say to me, Peter, you, you pick on religion. You, you, I do, because my Savior, Jesus, he picked on religion all the time. It doesn't mean that I don't love religious people. No, God loves religious people. Maybe you're stuck in your religion. You're stuck in your performance. You know that God loves you, and I love you. I, I care for you. That's why I talk like that. You see, the, the, the gist of it here is when the father goes out to plead with that older brother who is a picture of a, of a religious, self-righteous person, is that God loves people who are hooked on religion. 
and he wants to save them. So uh, the problem is sometimes people are hooked on religion. They don't see themselves as needing salvation. They see themselves as having it all. But the point nevertheless is Christ offers you salvation. Now, before I continue, look at this. Receive proclamations of Christ that have brought hope and healing to millions. Experience faith that releases the most awesome wonders of God. Without any human touch, the blind see, paralytics are restored, deaf hear, and multitudes respond to receive Christ. Sit back, relax, and read. You are there. The eight chapters in Peter Youngren's book take you to eight global centers where the power of the living Christ opens the door for a gospel breakthrough among Buddhists, Hindus, and Muslims. Discover Christ's gospel anew. Let faith arise in your heart as it has in the hearts of millions. Eyewitnesses say, Peter said, we don't preach healing, we preach Christ. Then Christ confirms his message with signs, wonders, and miracles. When Peter announced, Jesus Christ heals you, and the deaf ears of a Buddhist monk opened, I had to reassess what I thought I knew of the gospel. You can almost hear a pin drop as tens of thousands pray to receive Christ. I changed my thinking. Jesus saves. Peter really means what he says, but he doesn't lift up one religion above the other. He lifts up Christ. From a blind Buddhist monk in Myanmar receiving sight to a Muslim man raised out of his wheelchair in Indonesia, words cannot describe the wonders I have witnessed. All eyes were captivated by Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. To order your copy of You Are There, including a 32-page faith-inspiring photo gallery, call now, 1-416-745-1820, or go online at peteryoungren.org slash you are there. Well, I, I trust that you will get that book, 170 pages and all, with a picture gallery, photo gallery, and, and get one for a friend. It will build faith. It, it will stir your faith. It, it will... People will receive Christ. You know, millions have received Christ when they heard me speak these messages, which are now in written form, just as I spoke them. And, 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 and I'm told tens of thousands have been healed. So order that. And, uh, uh, but let's go back to our message. The story of the father and the older brother in Luke 15 it is really a story that there is new life. There is an invitation to new life for religious devotees. <laughs> you may say, well, people are down and out. People hit rock bottom. There's new life in Christ. Well, there's new life in Christ for religious devotees. Who, 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 because this older brother, he was like a d devoted. He, he was bragging on his good behavior. In fact, I, I hope you'll get the whole teaching. You know, I, I spent a week on this, which is you really need a month. And um, I have a teaching here with, I think it's six CDs. It's a terrific prize. It basically covers the shipping, but get, get a hold of that. It, it's something you, I, I say Luke 15 and the teaching I'm giving on Luke 15, every Christian ought to listen to it at least once a year. So, so get a hold of that. But let's read what happens here now when uh, the father is there asking this older, somewhat self-righteous, religious person that he depicts to come and join the banquet, the music and the dancing. So what happens? So he answered and said to his father, these many years I've been serving you. Ooh, he's, he's proud of his service. And he says, I never transgressed your commandment at any time. That's a mouthful. Never, not in the slightest way. And then he indicts his father. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. Well, he had two causes for pride. His years of service. He said, I've served for years. 
You can almost hear it. If anybody should receive God's blessing, it's me. I, I've been faithful for years. And not only have I been faithful, I have shown perfect obedience. Perfect. What an arrogant statement. If anybody says he's perfect, that man is a liar. It says in another scripture, that no one can say I have never failed. But, but, but this man has that audacity. There is, a, there is a religious pride that stinks, stinks to high heaven. Uh, I, I'm so good. I'm better than others. And, and, but then he says, I'm disappointed. I feel let down by my father. I feel let down. I feel disappointed with God. Do, do you ever feel like that? Sometimes people say, I feel disappointed with God. I feel God has let me down. He says, you never gave me anything. You never even gave me a goat. Now you made this great banquet for the younger brother, but you never gave me anything. You know, that makes me think of another story in the scripture. I'm not going to read it, but just recap it for you. A very, very close also in the gospel of Luke where Jesus talks about a prayer meeting in the temple. And, and, and there was a Pharisee and a tax collector, kind of one, one of the religious top shelf guys. And, and then the tax collector, which in the thinking of the Jewish people was as bad of a sinner as you could be to be a tax collector. And in Jesus' story there in Luke 18, uh, just a couple of chapters away from Luke 15, uh, this Pharisee, he's praying and he's saying, God, I, I thank you. I'm not like other people. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not like that tax collector. I'm not like that person. He, he's, he's saying, God, you should bless me. My approach to God, he's saying, is on the basis of who I am and who I'm, who I'm not, actually. I am not unjust. So, God, you should answer my prayer. And then he goes on. I mean, there's no end to it. He says, I fast twice a week. I give 10% of all I possess. So he's, he's approaching God on the basis of what he does. Oh, I hear this all over the world. People, people say, you know, you know, I've been faithful. I've been faithful in the church. You know, people say, oh, pray for her because she's been so faithful. And, and immediately I feel sad. It's like all the faith just drains from me. A pastor may say to me, oh, Peter, pray for him. He, he's, he's been faithful in this church from the beginning. I don't pray for people on the basis of how faithful you have been. I pray for people on the basis how faithful God is. You, you see, if our approach to God is on the basis of our performance, we will be disappointed. And, 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 and so in that story, that parable of Jesus, of the tax collector and the Pharisee, the, 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 the tax collector has a different approach. He said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He, he beats his chest. God, be merciful to me. And the point is this, if we approach God on the basis of who God is, full of mercy, we will never be disappointed. The first person approached God on the basis of his own performance and all the things that he was doing right, but the second one approached God on the basis of God's nature, full of mercy. Well, what's your approach? How do you approach God? And of course, the story ends that the tax collector, the one that everybody thought he shouldn't get his prayers answered, he had his prayers answered. Well, can I, back to, to Luke 15 here, verse 30. And so he says in an accusatory manner, the older brother says to the father, but as soon as this, your son, uh, who has uh, devoured your livelihood with harlots, as soon as he got home, you killed the catted, uh, fatted cat, not the cat, the fatted calf for him. And uh, I've been doing a lot of talking. He's, he's accusing the father. He says, father, you're too good. She, religion is quick to condemn. He says, I'm, I'm upset with my father my father is teaching, is, is treating my sinner brother too good. That's how some people feel. They think God is too good. They say, Pastor Peter, don't, don't preach. You preach too much on God's grace. People will think God's too good. They get mad about it. 
That's what, how the older brother felt. He said, no, you, you, you're so quick to treat him who's been a sinner bad. And, and then he says, he's been with harlots. How did he know that his younger brother had been with harlots? Because the father never said it. The younger brother never said, I don't know. Had he been sending spies to the foreign country to check it out? You know, it's amazing. There's something ugly, nasty about religion. What is he mentioning harlots here for? Nobody else would mention it. What, what, what business is it of the older brother to, mention, to bring that into the story? As I say again, look at the whole story. The father never says, oh, my son has been with harlots. And the younger brother who supposedly had been with the prostitutes, he never owns up to it. Maybe, maybe it was true. Maybe it's not true. I, I guess it's true, probably. But it's the religious person who wants to needle his brother. He wants a needle about, don't, don't forget what the bad you did. And he's accusing the father of being too good. You know, when we preach God's grace, some will accuse us uh, or that, that God is too good. And we say, you're making God too good. We can't make God too good. God is who God is. Why do people want a condemning God? Why do you want that? Don't you need God's mercy for yourself? Verse 31, and he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. Ooh, son, you are always with me. All that I have is yours. The great deception of religion is you don't have it. Or we could add to that. You don't have it and God isn't really with you. He's, he's there. You've got to call on him to come. Religion is all about you don't have it. And I'm talking about Charismatic evangelical religion is always about you need more breakthrough. You don't. You need to follow these steps. You need to use these keys. It's like a never-ending quest. You're never good enough. You never arrive. But 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 God's message, the gospel, is everything God has is yours. Do you, are you hearing me? Everything that God has is yours. Don't sit around waiting for God to give you things that He has already given and provided for you in Christ. The gospel. Look on your screen. I put it there. The gospel is about what you have because of Christ. Not, be, not, not, not what you have not, but what you have. You're not a beggar. You're not empty-handed. All things are yours. Then it says, it was right that we should make merry and be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. It's right. Yeah, it is. It's, the Father, it's right. Yeah, you may think we're wasting, you know, having this big celebration is, is wasteful. It's actually the father who is prodigal. The word prodigal means lavish. But he said, it's right. We should rejoice. Have you ever thought of, you know, this loving father who's a picture of God? When he forgave his son, let's go back to the younger brother for a moment. He took a chance. You know, there were no guarantees that that younger brother wouldn't take off again into a far-off country. But think about it. There's no guarantees. God took a chance on you. He took a chance on me. Luke chapter 15 ends in an unsatisfying way. We don't know what happened. Did the older brother join the banquet? Or did he stay outside complaining? We don't know. We always want to know the end of the story. Maybe it's supposed to end this way. I think it is. So the end it is, God keeps calling. We don't know whether the, the older brother said, yes, thank you, Father. I receive everything you have. But God keeps calling because this is the love that won't let go. Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, we receive every good thing from God. God hasn't given up on you. If you say, I need new life in Christ, then call the prayer center. Let someone pray with you. Send you material. Right now, you're accepted in Christ. You say, I've been prayed for a hundred times and nothing has changed. Don't quit. God hasn't given up on you. In fact, as I'm saying this, people are being healed right now. Arthritis is being healed. Headaches are being healed. Intestinal infections are being healed. In, uh, infections in your chest are being healed. Jesus Christ is your healer today. I want to hear what God has done for you. So please get a hold of me. We got seconds left, but uh, but. 
call us. But right now, look at this. The VIP family is about believers making their life count for Christ. The VIP family is a partnership with the Lord Jesus Christ and with one another. We believe in the cause of Jesus Christ, and together with Him, we are an unbeatable team. VIP stands for very important person and for visionaries in partnership. Billions of precious people don't see what Jesus Christ has done for them. Our mission is clear, to open their eyes to see the light of Christ's gospel. Millions receive hope and healing as the gospel touches their hearts. Jesus saves. Yes, Lord. I go up. Yes, Jesus is Lord. Yes, son of one. Hundreds of thousands of pastors are trained. True apostles and true prophets reveal Jesus Christ. Seven Bible school campuses equip students across Africa and Asia. Millions receive follow-up for new believers. Millions more are reached by television and social media campaigns. Persecuted Christians receive help and much, much more. The VIP family is about compassion for others and then about taking a step of faith. If we have a heart for God and the lost, this is the ministry to uh, support because they reach so many millions of people. Make your life count. Participate in daily gospel advancement. Participate in prayer and in convenient and constant giving. Many give monthly by automatic deduction from a bank account or credit card. Whatever your gift, you will participate in making history among those who have never heard the gospel. Call now, 416-745-1820, or give online, give.peteryoungren.org. Thank you. Thank you on behalf of people who, uh, when they hear of God's love in Jesus, they are changed forever, and we are reaching millions of them. If you believe in the cause of Christ, I think this is a very worthwhile investment. Do what you can. Give your very best gift. We need some big giving. Or join the VIP family or do both. Thank you. God's love compels us. Thank you. Your participation makes this global gospel ministry possible. To share your prayer request or to help bring the gospel to those who have never heard it, call 416-745-1820. You can give at www.peteryoungren.org or send your gift to World Impact Ministries at P.O. Box 62039, RPO, Victoria Terrace, North York, Ontario, M4A2W1 or P.O. Box 433, Winchester, Kentucky, 40392-9800. Together, let's give everyone a chance to know God's love in Jesus Christ.